Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. As always, you can support by heading over to patreon.com slash Tawahado. You can also support by sharing the words of God that you hear and the link to wherever you found this beauty, be it on YouTube or Transistor, Anchor, Spotify, Google, you name it. You could also rate us. I, I see there's a few ratings in the Apple Store, at least. That's where I do a lot of my podcasts. I actually get pretty split between Spotify and Apple. But anyway, you could you could also rate us and leave a comment if you like this and are thinking of non-monetary ways to give back. Today, we are in the Scroll of Apocalypse or the Scroll of Revelation, the Scroll of John's Vision, his Revelation, the Uncovering, Chapter 19. We're getting pretty close to the end, about three more weeks of this left, God willing, and we will have completed the non-Pauline epistles that are read by the associate deacon according to the Gutes right R-I-T-E, and the uh, Ethiopian and Eritrean tradition of publicly reading aloud during the liturgy. Once we've done that, my goal is to then do the portion of the liturgical biblical readings that are apportioned for the main deacon, and that is the Pauline corpus. So then we go through Paul's letters, and if the Lord wills, and you are all still listening to these words, and I'm still black and breathing, then we'll move on to the associate priest readings of the Acts of the Apostles. And if God is still so good to me that he wants his slave to keep on working, we'll get through the good old Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if we still have time for that, I think we'll have to dip into the Hebrew Bible. Of course, along the way, you'll be learning about the Hebrew Bible as it is found in the New Testament anyway for me, because I neither can nor will shut up about it. Without further ado, here's Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 to 5. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up for ever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. There's this strange phenomenon that happens where either certain Ethiopian Orthodox begin listening to a lot of Protestant teaching, or it's uh, some of the Ethiopian Protestants themselves, they begin to develop strange teachings. And one of the things they like to do is they pick up the European way of singing. And so they take this word, uh, and sometimes it's more American than European, but basically a Western way of saying it. And they'll say, hallelujah. And they're speaking Amharic, but they'll say, hallelujah. And, and it makes people so uncomfortable that sometimes they run away from this word, but this word is very beautiful. It's very biblical. And even within our own tradition, there is the Ankas Ahalita, which I'm sure I mentioned before, and I'm sure I'll mention again. The Ankas Ahalita, or the gate, the door of hallelujahs, 
includes a mist bait, five houses, each containing Giz, Izl, and Ararai, the three melodies. And so there are 15 different ways of singing the word hallelujah in our tradition. I think the most famous is for the Eucharistic liturgy. Hallelujah. I'm no great singer of it, but that's a, a very brief sample. And the meaning in Hebrew is praise Yahweh or praise Adonai or praise the Lord or praise that divine anti-name, that name that is a non-name, that name that is uh, against you trying to find out the name of the deity who gave you that name. The name of this avenger of blood, which is the life force of the martyrs. Um, <laughs> people were sharing as of uh, this date, February 22nd, 2021, about a year ago, there was a boxing match between the heavyweights, Fury and Wilder. And in that, uh, in the precursor to that, Tyson Fury said he wanted to taste the blood of his opponent. It's funnier because it, before their first fight, this was their second fight, before their first fight, they were of two different Protestant Christian backgrounds, and they were both trying to argue with each other about who's more Christian. In the last exchange, Fury was accusing the more charismatic American Christian Wilder of being pagan in some of the costumes he wears before he, he does his sport and some of the ways that he speaks about being uh, possessed or taken over when he does his fights. And now in, in this bout, Fury literally licked the blood of Wilder. And if you check out the first synod, as it's found in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, one of the things that Gentiles are supposed to not do, one of the only restrictions, and probably part of the canon law of the Orthodox Church, is to not drink blood, not to not eat blood, because that's where the life force is. And here you see the blood, you see the life force of the martyrs, of which you are not an avenger, but only the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Only Yahweh, the God with the divine anti-name, is the sole judge. Only the judge can be the avenger. Only the judge gets revenge. Revenge is not a dish best served cold by humankind. Revenge is a dish best served cold by God. So all those who are small and all those who are great should worship this God. This is an inclusive exclusivity or diversity in unity. We have many different rites in, amongst the Afro-Asiatics. We have Syriac, we have Coptic, we have Armenian, we have Ge'ez. We have one faith. We have one baptism. We have one set of holy scriptures. And we have one God. Verses six through 10. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The wife here, the bride, in contrast to the whore or the harlot of Babylon, is the church. The church is the wife of the Lord. We know that from reading Ezekiel 
and from reading Hosea. And uh, I've already invited you to read Acts 15 and Ezekiel 16 and Hosea 1, but now I'll tell you that I want to invite you to read Matthew 22, specifically verses 1 to 14, but just remember Matthew 22 and that'll be enough. Because in there you see that the coming kingdom is a wedding feast. And here in John's vision, it's happening. It's happening and yet it, it's not. This is prophetic literature. And so take it for what it is. Verses 11 to 16. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fearness, of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. You see the anti-name again? Only he gets to know what his name is. Don't worry what his name is, Moses. Don't worry what his name is, Jacob. Don't worry what his name is, John. It doesn't matter to you. What matters is the function of his name. What matters is what you do in his name. That's what matters. Not lip service but your slavery and servitude to his instructions written in his holy scriptures for you. King of Kings is this one of these great titles. People in the Ethiopian Empire, people in the Persian Empire, all these great empires have talked about. You could hear Tom Holland, the historian of British descent, waxing poetically about it with his fellow historian on his podcast, or you could read it in his books. You could hear a lot of people. You could hear Dan Carlin, another uh, an amateur historian, talking about it. It's, it's a common title. And empires are very common to humankind. But actually here, Tom Holland and Father Mark Bulos agree that the book or the scroll of Revelation is the most anti-empire, the most anti-imperial text ever written by humankind. That's incredible. I like that one witness from the allegedly secular and one witness from the church. Verses 17 to the end. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of, the, of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies, gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. The beast's team 
won't win, my beloved brethren and sister. It doesn't pay off to be on his team, at least not in the long term. Maybe you'll make some short-term money. But even then, the Lord could come quickly. Maranatha, Maranatha, Nalangita, come now, O Lord. Don't play in the lake of fire. It's not safe. Glory be to God for all things.